What's up, y'all? Welcome to In the Wild. I am your host, Rayshawn, and today we have a fun yet spooky episode for you. So in case you're unfamiliar, our Somerville campus is known to have quite a few ghosts. And today we're going to talk to a little or talk to some folks a little bit about those ghosts and why we're interested in all this stuff in the first place. So getting us started, we have two very special guests from the Department of English and World Languages. Uh, they are going to tell us a little bit about why we're interested in this stuff in the first place. So give a big, warm, general welcome to Dr. Fonda Armstrong and Dr. Valerie Cato. How's it going, y'all? Doing well, thank you for having thank us. You. Yeah, okay. thank you for being here. Um, trying to find some experts on campus to talk about this stuff was surprisingly <laughs> easy. Oh. I thought it would be difficult, okay. but yeah. Um, so thanks for being here. But getting us started, can you give our listeners, our audience, a little bit of an introduction and kind of about your background expertise in the English field. Okay. Um, so I'm Rhonda Armstrong. I'm a professor of English and I specialize in Southern <laughs> literature. And so, of course, with the South, we get an awful lot of the Gothic, um, a lot of ghost stories popping up. Um, my particular research area is actually on um, like bodies themselves and, and dead bodies and so stories about death and about the dead um, but very much not the ghostly dead I'm, I'm interested in the physical bodies um, but in southern lit you know we talk a lot about you know, the, the past isn't dead As Faulkner said the past um, the past is never dead it isn't even past and so like ghost stories are one way that you know we keep that past very much present and uh, with us today and so we get we get a lot of ghost stories that way and I'm Valerie Cato, and I'm a senior lecturer, and probably the best way to describe how I kind of integrate Gothic um, or ghost stories into teaching is through my comp classes. A lot of times the students are kind of interested in those sort of subjects and tying them into maybe pop culture movies that are Jordan Peele's, for example, movies and things like that. And we sort of look at those things. And also like children's gothic, kind of playing with those ideas just as a kind of a way to get them thinking about how to write about these kind of ideas and explore them. Well, I'm excited and thanks again for y'all being here. But uh, folklore, spooky stories, uh, kind of have a timeless appeal, I feel like. Uh, in your view, do you, what elements or themes do you think make these stories so captivating for people? So, and yes, they definitely have a, <laughs> an appeal. Um, and as Valerie said, you know, I use ghost stories and how I got involved with ghost stories on campus actually was with um, a composition class and I had my students writing about the Somerville campus um, and they could write about anything but once they found out that they could write about haunted places on campus and ghosts on campus I think maybe a quarter of the class maybe a third chose oh, wow. their you know like that's what they all wanted to do because they're the fun stories um, which is interesting because they went out into special collections um, and dug into a lot of the history um, about the specific ghosts and the buildings and the hauntings and the stories. And so they were doing all of this kind of hardcore historical research and writing it all up, um, but they were having so much fun because it was, it was ghost stories. Um, they really got into um, like the, the sort of detective work of it, you know, the sleuthing out, you know, like, well, the story is this, but really, um, you know, like there's no record of that having happened, um, which is, is pretty cool. And I, I think that a lot of it with ghost stories is we, we like things that are unexplained, but then like a ghost story gives you a way of making sense of this unexplainable phenomenon, you know. Um, weird things are happening and we don't maybe have, you know, a scientific explanation, but you can just tell a story about it and that makes sense of it in a different way. Um, and I think 
that a lot, a lot of it is just being able to sleuth things out and make sense of stuff in a fun way. Yeah, and I think just kind of like what Dr. Armstrong was saying about the detective part of these stories, so many of these stories, they're very formulaic. This is why a lot of mm -hmm. you know, writers who write these kinds of fiction can put out one of those stories pretty, what, frequently? <laughs> it's not the great American novel a lot of times, right? Although those have gothic things in them for sure. Um, but a lot of times that detective aspect has to do with the fact that there's usually some secret that um, you have to figure out or solve that secret. Uh, and so I think that's part of the fun part of that detective aspect of these sort of stories for sure. Um, other things that I think that are important themes in these kind of works are the theme of loss. Um, a lot of scholars now, um, one in particular who I like to follow is Stephen Broom. He talks about how Gothic is basically a narrative of trauma. And so I think that's why we have a lot of people who are interested in Gothic that um, may not have been the audience originally when we look at when it's, its inception. Um, and so we're noticing a lot of, for example, African Americans, Native Americans, they're really into Gothic now because it allows them to explore sort of the the, um, the traumas uh, associated, for example, with racism and these sort of things. So, mm -hmm. yeah, so it's interesting um, when we start to look at a lot of the characteristics of what makes a gothic work, um, how we see that trauma is a lot of times at the center of them, uh, especially some sort of loss has happened and the person is trying to overcome that loss, but there's nothing that can replace that loss. Um, and so the hauntings are sort of tied to that. So that gets to be very interesting, um, I think, for students too, as they're, they're mm -hmm. pursuing what's really going on, like Dr. Armstrong said, in these stories. You know, yeah. it's kind of that narrative that's underlying it. Yeah. Uh, speaking of pop culture, is there a particular piece of literature or film that you think has made like a really big impact culturally to the gothic space? Well, I think like Jordan Peele's, you know, Get Out. I mean, that is, when I saw that and, you know, having some familiarity with gothic scholarship, it just, you know, kind of checked off all the boxes. I just <laughs> thought it was amazing. Yeah. I mean, what he was doing. And he, he even admits that gothic's a pretty straightforward, easy formula to do, but sort of the ideas that he was raising in there and could do with that formula, um, I thought those were just um, terrific, you know, just terrific. Yeah. What about you, Dr. Armstrong? Oh, um, so um, yes, I think that you're certainly the newer, the newer and I guess more nuanced approaches to ghost stories and the gothic, um, like Peel, those are those are fantastic on and kind of like a deeper intellectual level. I also really just love the old school, yes. you know, the poltergeist, the conjuring. Um, I've been watching a lot of conjuring lately. <laughs> um, yeah, and the order. I just saw an article on the order you oh. have to watch them in. I was like, oh, okay. Well, I need to make sure I do that. Oh, I didn't. Yeah, know. they just had like a recent article on watch them in this order. Oh wow! <laughs> um, yeah. I've been watching them probably wrong. <laughs> I know, right? Because they're you know no, so it's like, yes, there's, there's no right or wrong. I'm sure. Um, but uh, where was I? It's so like though I mean it's just sort of like the the old school you know traditional more more the psychological. I'm not super into the the jump scares. Mm -hmm. um, and then you know the newer things you know like I I think that I think that Get Out in particular. Um, is doing some things trauma related that are it's it that's very I'm saying this badly. Right. Um, <laughs> it's about trauma. You know, you can't say right? It badly, but very right? closely related to sort of what I see going on in in, in Southern Lit right now, um, where you have stories that aren't traditional ghost stories, mm -hmm. um, but that are you know supernatural or they deal with um, spirits coming back and um, one thing that we see over and over with um, older um, kind of gothic and ghost stories as well is this you know, idea that the um, the ghost story kind of gives us a way of correcting 
the 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 violence and the trauma you know we we have characters who you know are, are constantly you know the ghost is constantly coming back and forcing forcing us to acknowledge what has happened um and we see that with you know a lot of a lot of old ghost stories as well um that something has happened but there's a, a sort of satisfaction with knowing that you know because of this ghost because of the supernatural element we're able to know the truth of what happened um we know that this injustice happened and so you know we're we're able to feel like we we're dealing with it i guess in a way mm -hmm. um and so we have writers today um a little bit older was like randall keenan visitation mm -hmm. of spirits um i think is fantastic in in the way that it does that um jasmine ward a lot of her m more recent stuff um certainly does that um that is i think that's the intellectually interesting right. part for me yeah. Um, and then just the fun part is just yeah. just the the good old you know sit down and and be a little bit scared about what's happening but but figure it out by the end you know so right. we know we know the story we know why this is happening we we can make sense of it yeah, yeah I, I hate when they leave us hanging of not explaining that why and going yeah. into you know giving us yeah yeah for no, those... that's that's a key to the ghost story yeah, yeah. I, I don't like the open to interpretation for mm -hmm. those type of stories because it's like no you need to yeah. Give us more. That. Yeah, that can be, and that can be difficult for some, like for Peel's first movie, I think most people would get out. They were, I feel like most audience thought that was more accessible maybe than when we got to us because they wanted mm -hmm. an explanation. Mm. So I think you get the best of both of those. If you want more of the one that's a little more overt, then, you know, get out makes sense in that. And then us maybe just a little bit less overt um, for some audiences, you know, but I think to Dr. Armstrong's point, this idea that these works really interrogate um, the ideas um, related to some, you know, societal ills that we would like to eradicate. You know, yeah. it really is a form that can do that through hauntings, that they continue to haunt us, you know, that way. So. Um, just off the top of your heads, what are some of your favorite spooky stories or whether it's a book or mm -hmm. a film or... So I like Peel, Real life, for sure. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but I like other things that are really in, more in line with a ghost story, like the others, like the movie, yeah. you know, there's Love Poe. I mean, Poe sure. is kind of most of our first introductions to that, other than like the books that, um, Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark, which is banned mm -hmm. all the time for kids, you know, right. um, mm -hmm. those volumes that relate to that. Um, I like I like those for sure. Yeah, um, yeah. I think definitely. Every, I think I think everyone loves Poe, um, <laughs> and and certainly you know doing Southern Lit. I I like some of the ones that um, you know kind of twist the the tradition. One story that I teach a lot is um, Ellen Glasgow's Jordan's End, um, which actually doesn't have any ghosts really in it. Um, but it kind of twists this sort of standard ghost story. We get a lot um, in the decades following the Civil War as we're trying to sort of solidify this lost cause mythology um, and kind of come up with a, a, a story about the South that holds it in, in one place and, and makes it kind of palatable um, in, in the decades after. Um, you get a lot of stories of you know the the women, sort of like we have on campus, like the Emily Galt story, um, with Bellevue Hall, where mm -hmm. she, you know, carves her name on the window, right. and and that part we 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 have some good evidence for, and beyond that, the story gets really really fuzzy, um, <laughs> and it, and it's okay, you know, because like the ghost story, we, we have a lot of fun kind of trying to figure out what elements of it are you know like true in terms of, of them being like this is a, a verifiable fact that is mm -hmm. specific and relevant to this place and this person um but i mean really and in literature we're far more interested in the 
the value that the story has, you know, just, just for us and what we need it to do. Um, and it doesn't really necessarily have to hold true to any external facts um, because it's our story and we're making it up for, for a reason. Um, and so you have those stories where, you know, you have the, the good and honorable and, and pure woman um, who is waiting patiently um, for her man to come home and, and maybe he never comes home. And so you see throughout the South, the, you know, some version of that story. Um, she's waiting and he never returns. Um, or you know, as we have with the Emily Galt story, she's, she's waiting or she, in some version she's waiting, in some version she's upset that he leaves and immediately kills herself. Um, whether or not, you know, that actually happened and there's really, it really seems like Emily Galt died in Virginia in, in 1914, <laughs> um, but she never married apparently um, and, and died in a sane asylum. Um, and so, you know, there are, there are sort of those elements to it, whether it happened in that house doesn't matter, but like we can have that story and we can see it there in this place um, and we can kind of imagine that character, right? Like we need this Emily Galt, we need her standing there because we need everything that she represents. Um, and so Glasgow in Jordan's End has the, the living woman and the men are sort of dying around her and she's still there, but she might as well be a ghost because of course this is the problem. If we, if we want to trap the woman in this past that no longer exists, the world moves on without her and what, you know, what can she do and really nothing. She has to just become a living ghost. Um, and so I like stories like that that kind of play, play with the traditions a little bit. It was a very long answer. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I, I appreciate that. Uh, another question as professors, how do you kind of incorporate your interest into your teaching and kind of getting <laughs> young, the younger generation to kind of take interest in this? So I make them watch Peel. <laughs> <laughs> I make them watch the movie, and then but 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 to set it up, they learn about Gothic, and um, emphasizing in general what's the what are the general characteristics of of a Gothic story, um, and then we learn that first as a foundation, and then the next thing we do is um, look at how gothic uh, one gothic theme which is trauma which re relates to emily gall because it's the trauma sure. of the loss with war sure right those war stories and why you know we why war is bad <laughs> you know uh -huh. that less we don't want to go to war you know it shouldn't be something easy to make the decision to go to war right it needs to be something we thoughtfully consider um so then we talk about uh, broom you know the gothic scholar talks a lot about trauma and by that time they're they should have enough of a foundation to kind of feel their way through the peel, watching Peel's um, movie. So that's that's usually my approach, how I get them going. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think the, really like the um, sort of coming at it from the Gothic, where really I don't teach a lot of traditional ghost stories, um, but this, like the interest in the ghost stories is kind of, built in, you know, um, and so I don't have to do anything to get students interested in the ghost stories. I can use their interest in the ghost stories to then get them interested in the other aspects of the Gothic and what it means to us, um, you know, socially and, and, and personally and psychologically, um, and why these stories always take the forms that they take. Um, because they're, I mean, and they're the stories that students always remember, you know, when, when we start reading the story and we start talking about tropes and kind of you know standard characters and standard developments they will always say like oh it's like this other story and they all have the stories mm -hmm. from their specific hometowns and they are surprisingly mm -hmm. similar yeah. you know like from place to place um and so th that part is i think th that's the easy part you know everybody's interested in ghost stories we we want to know so last question for you have either of y'all experienced or had any spooky interactions, either on campus or just off campus, that you're willing to share with us? So I have been waiting, you know, I, I spend a lot of time on campus. I spend a lot of time on campus in the middle of the night. I'm walking around. 
I know the stories. I'm cruising past Boykin Wright. Um, <laughs> not so much Payne Hall. And I have never seen anything. I'm waiting. I've every, I, I once was walking by Payne Hall, and I thought that maybe I saw something in the window, but I don't think there really was anything there. I think I'm too practically minded mm. to really have. If there are ghosts out there, they're not coming up to me. I don't know. But it kind of reminds me a lot of times, you know, the campus during the day mm -hmm. is vastly different than the campus at night. And so it kind of reminds me of the Hawthorne story, my kinsman Major Molyneux, uh, where yeah. he's the um, young child, right, is sort of looking for them. And he notices that the town looks differently at night than it did during the day. Um, and I think on campus at night, you know, in most ghost stories, at night you might. That's not to say that I haven't been into buildings that I felt like a little bit charged maybe or some, some sort of energy mm -hmm. that's there. Um, but I think it's, it's fun to talk about these sort of events and to share things. I mean, one of the things that we know is common with Gothic and ghost stories is the sublime. These things that are obscure, we can't explain what happened. And I think we've, I know I've had events happen where I really couldn't tell you what just happened and it was very strange. Um, and that's the fun of it. That's part of the human experience and kind of sharing these little camp stories, you know, these stories that you, you share around a campfire. Um, uh, that's, that's kind of just fun. It's a, it's a way of making a connection with others um, for sure. Well, thank y'all so much for taking the time to chat with us a little bit. Uh, for y'all that are watching, go explore campus. Maybe you'll have a sweet experience of your own. Uh, but yeah, thanks y'all. Thank you. Thank you. That's fun. <laughs> Hello, my name is Susan Davies and I'm your Vice President for Enrollment and Student Affairs. I'm so delighted that I get to talk with you today about Four to Finish. These are four aspects that we want you to incorporate into your life here at Augusta University in order to be successful. We feel like if you incorporate Four to Finish that you will be happier with your Augusta University experience and that you'll graduate on time. So what is Four to Finish? Number one, engage. We want you to engage both inside and outside of the classroom. Join a club or organization. Speak with your faculty member after class. Engage in undergraduate research. Number two, we want you to make purposeful choices. Make purposeful choices about how you spend your time, about your major, um, and even about who you study with. Make purposeful choices. Three is to develop your academic mindset. We want you to come into college and to be a student here at Augusta University with a growth mindset, with a mindset that allows for you to learn from others and to bounce back easily from mistakes. And number four is to follow your program pathway. This means following your curriculum in order to graduate on time, but it also means thinking about what you want to incorporate into your academic program to make it even more holistic for you. That might include an internship or student leadership. Leadership. When you graduate from Augusta University, we want you to graduate with your degree in one hand and a career plan in the other. And four to finish will get you there. What's up, y'all? And welcome back to In the Wild. And continuing our very special spooky episode, we have two very not spooky, but special guests. <laughs> they work for the special collections for our university library. So give a warm track of welcome to Miranda Christie and Courtney Birch. How's it going, y'all? It's going good. Yeah. <laughs> Thank y'all so much for being here. Um, as we were talking a little bit earlier, um, a little bit about what you guys get to do, which I think is very cool. But do you mind sharing with our audience a little bit about your role in the libraries and how it just connects to the greater part of the university? Yeah, um, so I'm the Special Collections Librarian, and I oversee the Special Collections both at the Greenblatt Library and the Reese Library. So at the Greenblatt, we have medical collections and uh, the history of like health sciences in the medical field, as well as uh, institutional records on the history of MCG and the health sciences campus. And then over here at Reese, we have collections on local history, so like Augusta, um, 
the greater CSRA area, just kind of history of the South, as well as institutional records from like Augusta State, Augusta College, Junior College of Augusta. Um, so we kind of steward and house the history of the area and the university. Yep. And then I am the Special Collections Assistant. Um, so I am based in Reese Library. Um, I've been here for about five years. Um, and like she said, um, we, ha we have the history of the university, so all of the institutional records, all of the different name changes through the years. <laughs> so it was originally a uh, junior college and then Augusta College, um, Augusta State, GRU, and, and now Augusta University. Um, and then we also have manuscript collections, um, history of Augusta, uh, mostly focused on the local history, and then the Central Savannah River area, the CSRA. So a lot of stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Which is, to me, I think is really cool. Um, just off the top of your heads, what is something that's a really cool artifact or the coolest artifact in your opinion that we have in special collections on campus? <sighs> Document or artifact? Like Let's go with artifact. Like a paper-based or an object? Like an object. Okay. Um, Don't overthink it. <laughs> <laughs> I can't think of a specific, but the Greenblatt Library has all these like medical tools and stuff. Um, we have these um, medical illustration sculptures. So there's like a brain and like a, a 3D handmade wooden fetus. <laughs> oh wow! <laughs> um, that we have on display there, and those are kind of fun. <laughs> At Reese, there's a lot more paper less artifacts um i found it's not an artifact it's paper but um i found a pardon for uh, confederate soldiers after world or after the civil war pardoning them and allowing them to you know remain in oh, the u.s wow. like <laughs> being like okay we forgive you for being part of the it's confederacy fine. it's Everything's fine we're fine. all united again <laughs> That's really interesting. Thanks for sharing that. Um, but to kick things off, can you get us started with providing a brief introduction to some of the mysterious buildings that we have on campus? So um, Augusta University has a lot of haunted buildings on campus. <laughs> In fact, on the internet, if you search us, we're one of the most haunted campuses oh, wow. in the U.S., apparently, apparently <laughs> according to one website. Um, so we have a lot. There's, you know, Confederate ghosts wandering campus. There's um, strange sounds that happen certain places, mm -hmm. opening and closing of cabinets, voices. Uh, there's one story of a former professor just walking on campus and like going into a cold spot and being like, I just went through a spectral <laughs> force because the person she was walking with didn't feel it. Uh, oh, wow. <laughs> so there's there's a lot. Um, the Boykin Wright House. Um, Rains Hall. Rains Hall. Bellevue. Bellevue. Wash. I think there was one at Washington. Or... I mean, one for each building. You probably okay. there's probably <laughs> at least one weird instance at each building. But Bellevue um, or Bellevue Cottage is probably you know one of the more well known haunted buildings on campus. Um, and the history of Bellevue um, that belong that property belonged to Freeman Walker, who was mayor of Augusta and also a U.S. senator. Um, and he sold the property to the U.S. government um, during the 1820s um, when to, to eventually become the arsenal. And so now we're standing in the grounds of the arsenal. Um, but Bellevue was built in 1805 or 1806, um, and that just came with the property um, when he sold it to the government. Um, and one cool detail um, is in that agreement for the government to have the land, um, they stipulated, Freeman Walker stipulated that the cemetery um, had to remain in the Walker family. 
So still today, it's known as the Walker Family Cemetery and only fam family members can be buried there and only family members um, can actually go into the cemetery. So it's, it's um, locked and um, not open to the public. But there are some ghost stories surrounding the cemetery as well. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of haunted sites on the campus of Augusta University. I mean, what do you expect from a campus that has a cemetery? Right? To be fair. Yeah. <laughs> um, could you tell us a little bit about Benet House? So Benet House is, I think, arguably the most haunted house because there's two known ghosts okay. that reside in Benet House. Um, Benet House is one of the older buildings on campus. It's named after Stephen Vincent Benet, who was a poet. His father, Stephen Vincent Benet, was a general uh, when it was the arsenal. And uh, it during the time of the arsenal, it was the commandant's house. And then uh, after years, it became a, when we were, became a college, uh, the president of the ASU, I think, lived mm -hmm. in that house, uh, at least for a, a portion of its time. And uh, now he doesn't, but it's still there. It's a pretty <laughs> house. <laughs> um, yeah. And it's got a couple ghosts. Yeah, shout out to our uh, Enrollment and Student Affairs folks who still work in those buildings. But, <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, but kind of just like, diving more into those stories, can you... You talk a little bit more about the spooky experiences people have had with those buildings. Yeah, I can, I, I can start with the Benet House. Um, it's a it's uh, it's got some of the oldest ghost stories. Um, so there's one ghost who, um, as legend has it, is the wife of a commandant who was a very, I mean, I don't like to, she, they, the, they say that she was a vain woman who okay. loved to dress up and have pretty clothes and she would just spend her mornings <laughs> upstairs just like looking at all her clothes Looking and trying mirror. things on. <laughs> um, her husband was not of that sort and he would go out hunting. Hunting was his thing. Hunting was yeah. his thing. And so every morning he'd be out, he'd get out up early and leave, and she would have her tea and look at the the um, her clothes. And then one morning, her husband got up early and left, and her maid brought up her tea, but she was already had her tea and was dead on the floor. <laughs> and it is thought that she still is up there looking out. She uh, looking at the clothes. Um, Clothes hangers. Some former laughing. ASU employees claimed that they like saw her reflection in a mirror up through the window. Oh wow! Um, on the second floor, and then down in the kitchens of the Benet House, there's the we common, commonly refer to it as the apple pie ghost, <laughs> who, as legend has it, was the nephew of a commandant who was provided with an extra cushy job that paid really well and wasn't a lot of work, um, which brought some ire from other soldiers at the arsenal. Yeah, they were not happy. They were not happy with him. And so one day he left his post to go grab some apple pie from the kitchen, and then he was shot in the back on the doorstep, and uh, he is supposedly still haunting that. Um, area so cabinets have been heard opened and closed and uh, there was one story of a former resident having made an apple pie and when they took it out of the oven and they s placed it down around the corner they saw the ghostly visage uh, <laughs> looking over at the pie so yeah <laughs> those are a couple of the the ghosts. And the other uh, major ghost story is associated with uh, Bellevue Cottage. So um, her name is Emily Galt. Um, so John Galt um, moved here to the arsenal. Um, he had a job here 
and he moved with his wife and his 12 kids. And uh, Emily was one of his kids, as well as her sister, Lucy. Um, so as legend goes, <laughs> um, Emily fell in love with a Confederate soldier. And of course, he didn't make it. <laughs> Killed in action. Um, and she was so distraught and so heartbroken that she flung herself from the second story window of Bellevue. Um, now, also, there is this window pane that's associated with the story. So apparently, um, her and her sister, Lucy, um, used her diamond ring. So this would have been her engagement ring, um, from her love, um, and etched her name into the window and then the date 1861. So that part is real. So there is a window. It does have her name etched into it and the date, 1861. Um, that's actually available to view. So like that's that's in Bellevue right now. It's on display. Um, the rest of it <laughs> probably didn't happen. <laughs> the facts don't quite line up with the legend on all of these stories. Right. But... <laughs> Um, but that's so, the fun of a ghost story. Yeah, of course. <laughs> it's embellishment. There's always like a kernel of truth in there. But yeah, apparently Emily Galt um, moved away from Augusta. Um, she never married. Um, she took care of uh, her mother and then moved to Tennessee with her brother, um, her sister and brother-in-law. Um, and then... There are records of her being um, a matron at St. Joseph's Orphanage um, in Virginia? I think so. Yeah. Uh, Washington, D.C. Washington, okay. D.C. Um, and then after that, um, she was, the, the records show that she was in the Eastern State Hospital um, in Williamsburg, Virginia, yeah. and that's where she passed away in 1914. Um, so apparently she had some mental issues, um, which some people could construe as supporting, like, she threw herself out the window and killed herself, but, you know, the fact that she was in a totally different city in a totally different state at the time. I mean, she could still be haunting yeah. <laughs> Bellevue. Yeah. Um, so when... Researching and kind of uncovering these ghost stories, was there anything in part of your discovery that really made you want to learn more or, like, really intrigued you to, like, do even more research? I think for me, I wish I had more firsthand accounts to go by. Um, a lot of what has been written... Um, has been, like, a former history professor wrote a book... He has firsthand accounts from former employees of Augusta State University that he used in his recounting of the of some of the ghosts. Um, but all of what's been written is very repetitive of like, we've heard this. And so mm -hmm. having some other documented facts other than these firsthand accounts, or me, I want to hear my own firsthand account. Yeah. And you're um, referring to Ed Cashin. Right? Yes, Edward Ed Cashin was the the former history professor, and then there's an, a few other books that reference um, that were written by other individuals who have firsthand accounts, and a lot of them are just like they exp like for Emily Galtz, the the ghostly occurrences were people were working late in Bellevue and they heard arguments in the hall and they went out. And they're like, no one's here. Um, and so that they happened more than once. It happened too. more than once to two or yeah. three people. And so they attributed that to Emily and the soldier fighting over him, oh. leaving to go off to fight um, for the Confederate Army. And so 
I want my own firsthand experiences. I'm kind of like, <laughs> mm, maybe I should reach out and see if we can have like a sleepover at Bellevue. <laughs> see if we can't drum up some ghostly uh, <laughs> experiences. And there have been some talks about um, reinstituting the ghost walk. So there used to be an annual um, campus ghost walk that was done by one of the former um, Special Collections librarian, um, Carol Wagner Angleton. Um, and apparently it was very popular. The students really liked it. It was well attended. Um, people love a good ghost story. So, you know, maybe sometime Hopefully. in the future, we'll have, you know, we'll, we'll revive that. We'll revive the campus ghost tour. So have either of you uh, had any like spooky experiences either on campus or anywhere else? Just chilling no. experiences? <laughs> I kind of wish. You but. know, I've only been on campus, what I, I've only been on campus for about a year, which I would say is not very long. And I haven't <laughs> ventured into a lot of the buildings. <laughs> um, so no, I don't think, I haven't had any any specific spooky things. I've had other spooky things at different places in my life. <laughs> so I'm waiting. <laughs> I got you. Well, if you stay on campus late enough, you probably will experience the something. The problem is I just don't stay after dark, so. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, you need to do what you said, like just have a sleepover. Sleepover. And you'll see everybody. We'll do like a night at the museum. <laughs> That's actually a great idea. I mean, the library is open late. That's so. true. <laughs> have a, we have ghost stories at Reese at night. Just yeah. <laughs> that, that would be, I think, a very fun experience. Um, mm -hmm. Why do you think people are so intrigued by these type of stories? For me personally, I think... I'm always intrigued because I'm always curious by the unknown. Like, no one knows and can say for certain what happens after we die. So what's to say spirits don't hang around for a little bit? And I think it's more fun that way. I think there's yeah. fun in explaining away what it seems unexplainable of yeah. when you hear a noise at night and no one's around. And there are just, there are still certain things that science can't explain. So we've had a ton of scientific progress, um, which is wonderful and advances in medical science. And we know much more about the world and it's constantly evolving. But I believe there's always going to be a certain spiritual realm where... Science not. is not going to provide those answers, and people are attracted to spiritual um, explanations. So, you know, they, they, they want to believe, you know, that it's something otherworldly. Um, and like she was saying, it's fun, you know, it's just... I think it's also innate. We like to tell stories. Exactly. Story, the storytelling element as well. Like that's, yeah, that's instinctive. So with the ghosts that y'all talked about today, what or who is one ghost you'd like to meet and who is a ghost that you wouldn't want to meet? On campus. On campus. <laughs> I'd like to meet Emily because one of the one of the uh, Augusta employees that mentioned seeing the ghost of Emily and her sister Lucy said that Emily was a friendly ghost was kind and friendly and had a good energy and that her sister Lucy was not a friendly ghost so I think I would like to meet Emily if I had a choice <laughs> but maybe not Lucy maybe not <laughs> <laughs> I think I would like to eat to meet either of the Benet House ghosts. One, because I want to know who they are. We don't know for sure who either of those are. We've got a name for Emily. It's like, okay, whether it's her or not, she's got a name. <laughs> but we're still a little hesitant on who, on who the, 
I want to know what happened. It was like, did he get shot in the back while he was going for apple pie? <laughs> I don't know. Our apple pie ghost. <laughs> apple pie ghost. I also, who doesn't love pie? Sit down with the ghost, <laughs> share some pie, and have a little, <laughs> have a little chat. Chat about it, campus history. Be like, so what was it like? <laughs> or make it like a, a campus tradition or like challenge to have apple pie at. Oh, let's start a <laughs> let's start a campus tradition where like there's one every October thirty first. We just make sure we have apple pie day. <laughs> have apple pie late at night. See what happens. See what happens. See if the ghost arrives. Uh, I'm in favor of that. It's an you apple pie seance. Wrong with apple pie. <laughs> Um, what are some other ways that y'all can think of for those interested to kind of have those spooky experiences, but also safe and respectful? Because we do have a cemetery. We do have Emily's uh, etching. I don't yes. know if that's the right word. Like mm -hmm. some of those things are kind of available on campus, but what would be the best way of I would say you can't enter the cemetery and don't try and enter the cemetery, no, but is. you can look at it through the gate. <laughs> yeah. So like walk and explore the campus, mm -hmm. like see what there is to offer respectfully. Um, if you're really determined, you could contact the Walker descendants, mm -hmm. the fa you contact the family and ask permission. Um, but I'm sure in that case, it would need to be for research purposes <laughs> or something very important and not just, hey, I, I want to walk through your cemetery. I want to walk through the cemetery and look for ghosts. I want to take a <laughs> selfie. <laughs> I think it's just always good to be, whether you're looking for ghosts or not, you're in a historic place where a lot of history has happened. So just be aware of where you are and like think about it. Because, I mean, I'm relatively new to campus. Um, I'm relatively new to my position. So I'm still learning the history. But, like, the history from the arsenal all the way through becoming Augusta University, a lot has happened on this campus. And there are stories behind it. Um, and so whether you're looking for... You're on campus late at night looking for the Confederate soldier walking towards across campus toward the cemetery, or you're trying to get a whip a whiff of apple pie as you walk <laughs> by um, Benet, or you want to walk in and see the the window of that Emily scratched her name in in 1861. Just try and learn about your your campus and where you are because it's a lot older than we are. <laughs> and and gonna, lessons to be learned. And it'll be here a lot longer than yeah, I was about to say, it's going to yeah. be here after us as well. Uh, but thank you all so much for being here. I don't know if folks can tell, but I have goosebumps now <laughs> from all of this stuff. Um, and I want to go check out some of the stuff y'all mentioned as well. Great. Glad. Thanks for having us. Thank you so much. <laughs>